I'm here with my friend Ross Duffin. I'm very glad to see him. It's been a while. Um, you may know Ross from any number of ways. He's written a lot of very cool books. He has a great book about temperament that anybody can read, which is not true with most books about temperament. He has, a, I think, two books now about music in Shakespeare's plays. He's edited a huge amount of music. He's a conductor, a singer, uh, an instrumentalist. Uh, who I don't know what he I don't know what he isn't. Um, but for many years, he directed the very distinguished program in I don't know whether they called it early music or hist historical performance or whatever it was, and still is at Case Western Reserve University, one of the premier degree granting programs, as everybody listening to us, I'm sure, will know. And I'm delighted to see my old friend Ross Duffin, and I'm we're really just here to sort of shoot the breeze a little bit about the role of higher education in the training of uh, musicians and of uh, and particularly of musicians in historical performance, and it and in general the role of higher education in the HP world. So Ross, welcome. Nice to see you. What are your preliminary thoughts on such a on such a broad idea? Well, it's interesting in thinking about it, uh, since I got your invitation to, uh, to do this, I, I thought, well, you know, when we started out back uh, doing this back in the 80s, that is organizing uh, higher ed in uh, early music America, it was mostly musicologists, if not exclusively musicologists, musicologists who were assigned to do collegium and uh, whatever other in, uh, early music ensemble because they had the historical expertise to do it, not because they were performers. And to me, that's the biggest difference now with um, historical performance in higher education now because everyone realizes that you can't, you can't really do this at the level that the music deserves um, if you're only a musicologist. Um, you know, some people like you are performers at a really high level and, uh, and can do both. But I think it's a really good thing that there are um, performance specialists that are now involved um, in these programs uh, doing historical performance, early music. Yeah, I agree. Um, except, that, uh, yeah, it used to be that whoever was the last musicologist hired was required to do what was called the collegium, which mm -hmm. anyway. And uh, there are uh, uh, there are lots of different kinds of levels and sizes of program depending on the kind of, the, of institution and things like that. Do you think, though, what you say that that now people realize if they're going to have performers doing early music, they're going to have to have performers showing them how to do it rather than musicologists showing them how to do it. Do you think that's changing the opportunities there might be for young performers in historical performance? Well, <clears throat> I think I think it probably is. I mean, you know, I've been retired now for two and a half years, so I, things have changed a lot. I mean, here you are doing a, a remote teaching uh, of classes at an institution that's, uh, you know, a long way from where you're living. Mm -hmm. um, and so the world has changed a lot. And so I don't know, I don't know if I'm a, a great expert on it, but I can say that I think that it has in some ways opened up opportunities for people to do remote teaching. I, I mean, I know a lot of people um, like Ellen Hargis who taught voice for us um, and she would fly in from Chicago once a month and, and uh, spend two days, two to three days teaching her students, giving them long lessons. And now all her teaching is done over Zoom. And so it seems to me that um, that performance specialists can be involved in teaching and in, sometimes in remote colleges that couldn't afford or couldn't attract uh, performers. And, uh, and so now it, I think there may be opportunities for people to, uh, to be doing that kind of thing. So this may be one of the things that we learn from this plague. Uh, I, I am interested in making a list of the things that we'll be glad of, things that we've learned. I mean, decent teaching over Zoom, uh, doing music, doing music remotely is always going to be difficult, but I see what you mean. It's also true, you bring up the phenomenon of the expert performer who is a part-time um, teacher, employee, faculty, or adjunct or something at one or more institutions, and that's a pattern uh, in many, many places, isn't it? As it was for you, even in a big program like yours. Sure, absolutely. I mean, 
Um, I was still a fairly young <laughs> academic when I was given a, a chair, the Finette H. Coolest chair. And um, my salary was so low compared to the previous holder of the chair that um, I asked if I could take some difference of that and apply it to bringing experts um, in to teach uh, lessons. Mm -hmm. And so that's how that started. And it quickly became clear that it was what was going to make the program go, that yeah. having these uh, experts at that level come in and teach our students. And, and so that, that became a really important part of, uh, of what we did. Do you have any sense of how those experts felt about it? I think they were they were unsure at first, but um, the fact is we were very selective in the students we admitted. Um, yeah. Like uh, Juilliard, we were offering um, uh, waived tuition for mm -hmm. the students that got into the program, um, but also a stipend. And so we didn't have that many slots and we were very selective. And also the fact that we didn't have the teachers actually on the faculty meant that we could just accept the best people and then find the teachers for them. I mean, I remember a conversation, you mentioned that um, event that Tom Binkley hosted in uh, Bloomington in 95 or something like that. And he said to me, you know, our situations are so different. I have these great faculty here and I have to find students for them. I, they need to have these students in their studio. So that's how we you know, build our program. Whereas I'm sitting there thinking, okay, we're just gonna take the best individuals, no matter what their performance media, and then I'm gonna bring in whatever teacher seems mm -hmm. best for them. Yeah, um, that's a great thing for the students. And uh, I, I'm actually thinking about it from the point of view of people who are studying at Juilliard now and are probably going to need to try to piece together for themselves some kind of a life that includes as much music as possible in this complicated world where life is tough for musicians anyway. Um, and I wonder whether, uh, I mean, uh, how, what, what sort of madness it involves to put together a bunch of little pieces like this. I mean, I know Ellen uh, Hargis taught for you. I know that she's now doing similar stuff at Eastman and maybe other places too. I wonder if that's a, a sane life for an early musician or maybe the only life for an early musician. <laughs> Any thoughts well, on that? I, I mean, I, I think it was very hard. At one point, Ellen was doing the Case Western Reserve and Eastman and um, Oberlin, so she could do that when she flew to Cleveland as well. Mm -hmm. And she was then she started doing Longy as well. And um, that that was a really hard thing. And and for someone who has a performing career as well, that is a lot of traveling. And I think it's a lot easier for her and would be for other teachers as well to be doing some of this over Zoom. Yeah. Um, but I it also occurs to me that you know small colleges. Uh, one thing that I found is that. Um, we had a joint program with the Cleveland Institute of Music. So a lot of the students that were in our ensembles and wanting to learn early music, learning historical performance came over to us from CIM, which was literally, you know, a block away. It was right. a two minute walk. Um, and whenever the opportunity arose for guitarists to study the Orbo, especially since they didn't have to cut their nails and things like that, they would jump at the chance. And, and so it occurs to me that um, the, Juilliard students, I know you've had the Orbo players um, specialized there. They could offer themselves to small colleges in the middle of, of nowhere to teach Zoom lessons to guitarists that were interested in, in, uh, in having instruction in that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's where I think um, that uh, the opportunities given by remote teaching and learning could be something, uh, could provide opportunities for um, Juilliard students and others. Um, to do early more widely. I know that, that, that I, I don't know much about it. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, I'm one of those people myself who kind of uh, was a part-time employee, but I, I think that at least in some cases, the historical faculty at Juilliard teach also secondary lessons to people whose principal instrument is not that. Uh, to what extent were you involved with that with CIM or case pe people or in general, what do you think about that as a way of kind of either bolstering the system or, or uh, I mean, bolstering the teaching system or uh, 
as a possible view of the world, like the broadest possible musician is also arguably the best musician. I don't know. Right. Well, I think it's really important because you know, at the pre-college level, how many students have the opportunity to, to study historical performance? Right. Um, and so, I mean, the number of students that came through our program or came through CIM and did early music or historical performance with us is really amazing. I mean, people like, um, just to think of viol players, Joanna Blendolf, Craig Trumpeter, John Mark Rosendahl, people like that were CIM students who started playing viol in our um, ensembles and that became their careers, you know? So um, I think those opportunities are really important. And we, we provided them sometimes just through ensemble participation. You know, uh, Julie Andrzejewski, who um, uh, is the coordinator of Baroque Ensembles for our program, um, she uses the Baroque Orchestra as a teaching ensemble. You, you can't sign up for Baroque Chamber Ensembles with her or with Yaptra Linden, who are, who's also teaching there, unless you've been in the Baroque Orchestra, so that there's some basic instruction that goes on in the ensemble. But students are also able to sign up for lessons. The complication with that, and I don't know whether it's changed since I left, but um, there was an applied music fee for secondary lessons for CIM students. The like, university students didn't have to, um, to pay an applied music fee for secondary lessons at all. So we got plenty of those, but um, it can be steep for um, conservatory students who really want to do it um, to have to pay an extra fee. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're just struggling to put food on the table and pay yeah. your rent, um, and, and sometimes pay tuition or partial tuition, um, it's hard. So um, I know that situations are different in various places, but I do think that secondary lessons are a vital part of, um, of introducing people to historical performance and early music. Well, it is true, of course, that most people don't learn an early instrument in high school, do they? Maybe it's trickling down, but it hasn't happened yet. So if it doesn't happen at the college or conservatory level, it won't happen until what used to happen, which is uh, much later, you know, as an amateur mm -hmm. recorder player or gamba player in your 40s or 50s. That's another possibility. But um, <laughs> anybody who probably wants to make a life of it and makes it, make a career of it had better get started early. Yeah. So the, second, the secondary lessons is an important aspect not to be sneered at probably by either teachers or students. I agree. And I, and I think that, um, you know, we were trying to convince uh, the administration of, at CIM that it was, yeah, their students were paying tuition and that they had an interest in this. There was expertise. They deserved to uh, have this opportunity. And, and, you know, um, some of our own full-time faculty at Case became CIM instructors. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so why couldn't they, you know, study secondary lessons with these CIM faculty? You know, the, I, I didn't really get that, but... Uh, it's probably um, short-sighted on CIMs. From yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what do you think, what do you think might develop in the future? What, 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 trends or changes do you see in higher education and music? Uh, I mean, that's a lot to ask because we're talking at, at the same time about conservatories, about universities with uh, big music schools, with universities, with music departments, but not even schools, and liberal arts colleges and community, all that kind of thing. And then we say higher education, meaning all that, which is a huge part of the world. Nevertheless, Ross, you're a wise fellow. What do you what kind of trends do you see or hope for or fear in the future? Well, uh, one thing is that I think that the um, acceptable fields or repertoires of study for music in universities, colleges and universities is broadening rapidly. Um, I mean, one of the things that was true of the case program is that um, you know, half of our faculty, musicology faculty, were interested in rock and uh, rock music and American popular music. And the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland and, and, you know, several of our students would go there as interns and things like that. So it was completely taken for granted that, sure, well, of course, music majors uh, can be specialists in rock music. And um, so I think that um, the idea that Sure, there's a much wider range of repertoires that people couldn't specialize in as music majors um, or as, as students who are in ensembles or, or interested in music generally, not, not even necessarily majors. 
And so I think that's a very good thing for um, early music and historical performance. And um, uh, so broadening, broadening the repertoire means that, oh, sure, then people can come in and, and specialize in that rather than in 19th century European concert music. So um, in a way, that would mean that broadening the HP repertoire within the classical repertoire, which has been happening lately, is fine. But at the same time, the classical repertoire is becoming a smaller portion of the available smorgasbord of music than it ever used to be in the past. Yeah, I think that's true, certainly. Um, um, and that's what I mean by saying, you know, that we have students majoring in in rock music rather yeah, than, right. and that didn't used to be true. I mean, that's been over the last 12, 15 yeah. years. Um, but I, uh, on the other hand, um, I do think that the whole historical performance approach is an important one. And it, it's one that was not present in um, traditional classical music instruction for a long time. And the idea that, um, uh, that you learn performance practice, you learn um, improvisation, you learn skills that were part of just being a musician um, uh, a couple hundred years ago or, yeah. or even less in some cases, um, that um, makes you a more complete musician and is more fulfilling uh, uh, for musicians in performance too. Yeah. Um, one of my um, colleagues is uh, Francesca Britton, who's um, terrific 19th century musicologist, but also an unbelievable forte pianist, um, which we really didn't know until she got tenure because she uh, refused to perform in public until she got tenure. And then all of a sudden everyone goes, wow. <laughs> oh, goodness. And so we were at a preview of a, a lecture recital, uh, which was a 19th century American chamber music. And the pianist at one point sat there and waited for something to go on. and. Francesca stops and says, what are you doing? And, and she said, well, there's nothing in the piano score. And she said, yes, but you're supposed to improvise now. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, for a pianist to all of a sudden be told to improvise is not something that pianists normally do. And, and so the realization that, okay, yeah, this is the middle of the 19th century. And there is the expectation that you don't just play the written notes on the page. You say you play something beyond the written notes on the page and contribute to the performance in that way is daunting, but it's also extremely exhilarating and, and fulfilling for musicians to do that. Absolutely. And that's something that we that we spend a lot more time doing than the rest of them do and that we can bring to the much broader field as a whole. So Ross, how do you think performers uh, nowadays might position themselves to to take an active part in in historical performance in higher education in the future? What would you what would you advise people to do? Well, um, <laughs> that's a hard one for me. Um, it's hard for everybody. If if we yeah sure if, yeah if I don't know. be rich. Yeah, I don't know that there's a really good answer that I can give, but um, I think, as I say, I, I think for me, improvisation is is a, a really important key. That if you are so comfortable on your performance medium. Um, and mostly this involves instruments, um, then that's a key to opening up a lot of confidence and um, expertise in different repertoires. And, and things become clearer about historical performance and how things can be performed and why it makes sense to do them in a certain way um, when you can address, uh, address these repertoires from that standpoint. Right. But when you as a director, uh, I don't know if you were making the choices, but when, when you were going to look for somebody to bring in to teach kazoo or whatever it might be, what sort of person do you look for? I mean, if I'm, if I'm looking to be the person who comes and does the early music vocal teaching at Case Western Reserve, what are you looking for in me that makes you choose me? It's, I'm, my, it's my performing ability, is it? Or is it something to do with my teaching ability? Well, I think it's performing ability, but, um, but also um, interpersonal um, skills and um, thoughtful interest in the history of the repertoire and, um, and in uh, the history of technique on the instrument. I mean, there's quite a long literature, for example, of, of uh, uh, discussions of voice production and, and, uh, and vocal technique and so on, dating back into the 17th century at least. Yeah. 
Um, so um, if someone showed an interest in that sort of thing and thought about how it might be applied to their own singing and, and how, um, how different, um, different singers might benefit from some of these uh, things, that would be uh, someone that I would be interested in bringing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're looking for, obviously you're looking for chops. If you can't do it, you can't, right. but, but, but in an, in an educational institution, you're also looking for a kind of background, kind of knowledge background and a kind of an attitude towards the repertory on the one hand, and also an ability to communicate on the other. Yeah, everything. I want. I want somebody who can do all those things. You want everything. Yeah, that's right. And we all we all want to be able to provide that. I don't know that, that we all can. Well, well, and and also, I mean, not everybody is inclined to to want to invest their time and energy in teaching and and in thinking about what's going to make this this uh, student a better performer and better musician. Yeah. Uh, Juilliard at this point is mostly focused on Baroque music, um, but you spent, uh, I mean, I think the program at Case, although there was a lot of Baroque music, was far from being limited to that, and I overstate it when I narrow it down that way for Juilliard because there's a lot of classical music, there's a lot of really early 17 and some other stuff too, but generally Baroque music seems to be the thing that attracts the most attention nowadays. Um, you were, but but how do you feel about early music as being broader than Baroque music? Oh, I, I feel very strongly about <laughs> it. And, and it was one of my great regrets um, with the establishment of the Juilliard program. Um, and as you say, it's evolved differently now. But at first it was a Baroque program and it kind of set the example for conservatories across the country that early music was Baroque music. Um, and that it was a legitimate thing for conservatories to do um, because Juilliard was doing. And, and yet there are so many other repertoires and particularly earlier repertoires that I love dearly um, that were being neglected. And um, I take great pleasure in the fact that some of our graduates are off doing professional medieval ensembles. And, yeah. uh, and, and that doesn't happen in all programs because they don't have the opportunity to work um, to work with people that have the expertise and to work with people that know the repertoire and, and things like that. So the fact that the students can go off and start their own ensembles and make recordings and, and, um, and do things like that is, is very gratifying to me. I, I feel it's one of my, one of my accomplishments um, that I feel uh, good about for having um, led that program for so long. Well, there are a lot of things that you accomplished and a lot of things you should feel awfully good about. It's a model program in lots and lots of ways. And so far as I can tell, it continues strong, which must mean that you built a good structure there that, uh, uh, that's not just built on the raw stuff in show. And that's uh -huh. another thing to be proud of, really. Well, I, I hope that's true. Although I must say, um, I was disconcerted that when I retired, um, they did not replace me with a full-time faculty member. They hired four adjuncts instead. Uh -huh. And the adjuncts were all good, but um, it's not great for them to be adjuncts. And I think it's not so good for the students not to have a mentor um, who is always there, um, you know, that, that can help uh, counsel them and direct their direct their studies. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think the program continues to succeed and uh, draw really good students and, um, and produce really good graduates. But um, I was sorry. I gave them two years notice that I was retiring. And, and even so, they, um, um, they just hired adjuncts instead. Well, there, there are going to be a lot of economic issues in higher education and the in the upcoming years, as we all know, as there, are, as there is going to be across the society and across the economy, and I'm not sure. And, and maybe it means that there's opportunities for more people to be involved. Uh, if well, there, if yeah. there are you know, four adjuncts instead of one full-time person, or it could be even more than that. You know, uh, obviously, ad, the adjuncts don't get paid well. Uh, you're probably an exception, but um, no, 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 I am not an exception to that. I do it for fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I needed the money. If I needed the money, I wouldn't be doing this. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, you know about that. Anyhow, this is great. Do you have any 
parting words of wisdom for people who are at Juilliard now and deeply committed to early music? No, I just think that um, uh, it's great that they're doing this. It's lucky for them that they're in a place that has such fantastic uh, teachers like you and, and Robert, who, you know, I have the greatest respect for. And, um, you know, so, uh, so great for them and being in New York and hopefully when things open up again, it's going to once again be, you know, a, a vital hub for performance the way it has been. Let's all hope for that. Thank you very much for your cheering words, Ross, and your okay. words of wisdom. Thank you, Ross. All right. Great to talk to you. Thanks.